What's up Karate Nerds? I am here with the one and only Hanji Patrick McCarthy, the Western world's number one karate historian, researcher and author. And today I've prepared five fascinating questions for him to answer. Let's see if he can teach you something about the history of our fascinating art. Thank you very much Hanji McCarthy for making this interview possible. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, you know, we go back such a long way, and I feel very comfortable being here. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with the Karate Nerd Experience. Uh, it's been a fabulous weekend, and, and I, I think I've probably done more learning than teaching here. So, thank, thank you so thank much. You so much. It's just, it's, just, it's just a great environment. I don't feel any aggression or ego. Everybody's. And they're from all over the world. How do, yes. you, how do you do this? <laughs> you, you know very well. <laughs> right, so let's get to it. Number one, the very first question that I have for Hanshi McCarthy today is this. One of the major things that defines and unfortunately divides karate practitioners today is styles. And so my question is, why are there so many different karate styles? And what did karate look like before we had styles? What is the historical perspective when it comes to styles of karate? Great question. Thanks for asking. And I really don't have to think much about that uh, because I've done so much research uh, into the old ways and understanding the anthropology and the culture from which the tradition comes. I've seen what forces have affected and shaped the evolution of the tradition. So, but. The first thing that comes to my mind when you said that was uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a comment that Miyagi Chojin made back in the early 1930s in preparation to go to Hawaii. Um, I ask, uh, if you were asked to determine the differences between styles, uh, what exactly would you say? So, so let me cite uh, Miyagi Chojin. Um, he said, if I had to put my finger on it, I would say that it would be the different methods of teaching the same thing. Not everybody does the same thing the same way to achieve the same goal. And a deeper truth is even this is that you will not do the same thing the same way across the spectrum of your life if based only on the dynamics of age alone. Yes, now you're 20, Lala. Oh, now you're 80. <laughs> okay. But you know something, the strangulation doesn't change, the tackle, the, head, the mechanics that support it, they all remain constant and immutable. Therefore, it is our ability to understand it and often our inability to actually understand it that create the differences. What did karate look like before it became karate? There, and, and not the sporting version or the modern lifestyle practices that bring us together. It was a self-defense and it focused largely on those habitual acts of physical violence that plagued, well, in that case, plagued Asian life, uh, specifically Okinawan Chinese. Chinese was an enormous influence upon the Okinawans and Ruki, well, Okinawa's old Ruku kingdom. And so, therefore, a, a lot of those practices were reflected on the social lifestyle of that time and culture and understanding something about the cultural landscape and the social mindset help open up another door for us to better understand that particular thing. The only way with which to be able to understand how to effectively negotiate an act of physical violence indigenous to that era would be to replicate it and practice it inside a two-person practice. Uh, passive resistance to begin with, and then gradual to exponential investment of aggressive energy uh, for the express purpose of learning how to overcome it. And then, of course, uh, uh, so therefore, the two-person practice itself was the art. And the idea of then practicing what you had learned could be culminated in a solo reenactment. And when you link the solo reenactments together into some type of geometrically configured solo routine, you subsequently got something greater than the sum total of its individual parts. And of course, therein, although a little bit off the question, uh, lies in the development of, of kata. Uh, the kata was never meant to actually teach you anything. It was actually meant to culminate what you should have learned in a two-person drill in the first place. So what did, ka what did karate look like, although it wasn't called karate? It looked like that. Yeah. Awesome. Next question. 
what are some of the most common misconceptions or myths that people seem to have when it comes to the history of karate? Wow. And we don't have to go through all of them, right? No. Okay. Because I know uh, that there are some. How, how about if I give you uh, perhaps a reason why they've occurred, and then I'll let the viewer determine <laughs> the uh, deduction from the abstract. Um, <clears throat> and as I said last night in our lecture about the anthropology of the heritage and legacy that brings us together, uh, and I cited a long list of cultural anthropologists uh, uh, as I was citing their work, so don't shoot the messenger. Uh, we often hear the term that uh, budo, of which karate is an integral part, is a microcosm of the culture from which it comes, a miniature representation of a cultural landscape and a social mindset and protocol, etiquette, customs, rituals, so on. And therefore, it pays some dividends then to understand something about the culture from which the tradition comes. Um, and, and, and in this regard, it's important to understand there's modern Japanese culture is based largely on a thousand years of male dominated, homogeneous, extremely discriminatory culture of conformity nestled in uh, a Confucian based mindset. Uh, and the first tenet of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, a Confucian mind is a filial piety or ancestor worship. And, and uh, in ancestor worship, the questioning of authority is very much frowned upon. And if you think in terms of how something is imparted, a story told, a tradition taught, a kata learned, a story given, there's no question of that authority. And therefore, the mechanism in Japanese culture through which these kuden, these oral traditions are handed down, then they're not questioned and uh, the imitative behavior promotes the trickle-down effect which helps perpetuate this mindset. And there's a mechanism inside Japanese culture that helps perpetuate that and it's called imitative behavior. Uh, and that's the senpai kohai system. So can you imagine uh, sorry, I took a curve to get to the answer. If someone said to you, Yes, uh, I think a color, I'm on the tip of my toe, and I touch you and you'll die. Oh my God, don't ever do that because you'll die. And somebody says, That's not true. It is so because my master told me that. And nobody's ever bothered to question the master or ask and use critical thinking, which is in fact the most acceptable mechanism to help penetrate the ambiguity of the tradition, which might otherwise be easily better understood. We in the West tend to be much more individualistic about this conformance-based practice. A little again off the topic, but I think that sums it up. Yep, absolutely. Number three, one of your most famous books is the Bubishi. Why is this historical book so important? And why did the old masters call it the Bible of karate? It's not my book. <laughs> Just want to make sure everybody knows that it's not my book. Uh, but I did have the good fortune to come into contact with that book very, very early in my practice. In fact, in the early 1970s in Chinatown on Dundas Street, there was a, a, something, a, a bookstore next to the something. And I used to love to go in there and look at all the Chinese Kung Fu books. And one of them I bought for two, I still have it by the way, $2.45 was the Chinese pirate copy of Mabuni Kenwa's 1934 study of Sei Pai Kata. And in the back half of it was uh, Mabuni's version of Itoso's Bubishi. Uh, 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 so I've had a very early start on it and I was very friendly with many people, uh, Chin and Tero and so on, who helped share their knowledge with me until I got to a point where I understood the value of what this book represented. Then I set out on a mission uh, to better understand its nature, which goes beyond the time frames that we have to talk about it today. But the Bubishi for me has been a, a passion. Uh, it's, it's been um, a continual work in progress. It is Okinawa's ancient book of knowledge. It shares with us the link between the progenitor traditions of, uh, of China, specifically the South, and something about Chinese, for example. You know, 
we often hear Chinese China, Chinese define their traditions by internal, external, north and south, hands and feet, northern legs, southern hands. And we have been able to help penetrate some of this ambiguity to find that the karate uh, that we practice traces its origins largely to southern China, specifically Fujian province, and uh, as close as we can determine, Yongchun village. Uh, with the crane style uh, 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 flavored by the monk fist boxing. The Bubishi tells us that. Uh, it explains herbal and uh, pharmacological concoctions, its value and link to our fighting heritage and legacy. It tells us about escapes encounters, uh, blood and air deprivation, limb entanglement, joint manipulation, balance displacement, escapes encounters, percussive impact using the hard fist methods, uh, and the value of anatomical vulnerable points. It has a philosophical insight, it has historical content. It, it, it is virtually the Bible of Kanate. And those young men embracing those practices during the late 1800s and the turn of the century, and the lineages of Higone Kanjo and Ito's uncle, not having the internet, the Google libraries, can I get a book on karate? Their sources were very limited. And so the opportunity to uh, become part of a tradition that had a book of knowledge, why wouldn't they have thought of it as, as that's my Bible? And for the detractor who might go on the, that's uh, uh, an insult to compare it to the Bible. Stuff. It, it, it's metaphoric and it's it's it, it's biblical and it's, it's it's the origin. It's the source, and by referring to it, it does have everything. It covers all of the areas that we really need to look at. It, it covers the history, the philosophy, uh, the spiritual element, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, pedagogical, uh, the anthropological. Uh, it, it really has everything, and. It's also one of those books, Jesse, that the more you read it, the more you seem to get from it. You know, I have more than 35 years or 40 years with that book. I continue to read it all the time. And another wonderful thing about the book, if I can say, is it also helps bring into contact with other people who are equally as passionate about it. And I was very grateful that you were uh, willing to share uh, your insights and contribute to it as well. So the Bubishi folks, if you haven't read, if you haven't read it, please do. Yep, you should. Number four. Today, many people practice karate as a sport, but originally, the purpose of karate was self-defense. So how and why did karate turn into a sport? Well, that's a, that's a laid question with some political nature as well. For those of you who embrace the historical evolution of attrition, you will know uh, that uh, during Japan's period of radical military escalation, uh, we have some reason to believe that a German named Karfi Graf Durkheim uh, had some insight as the professor of medicine at Tokyo University and the private physician for the Taisho Emperor. Uh, in German culture, they used swordsmanship and wrestling for fitness and uh, uh, how to settle disputes, if you will. Uh, and during that period of time, you might remember the Tom Cruise movie, Last Samurai. So around that, we call that the Bakumatsu, the end of the military-style control, um, and the desire to bring Japan into the open world. There was a great deal of conflict. And, and so Japan reached out to Prussia, Russia, Britain, France, uh, and even America to draw from commerce and industry and, and science to help build a culture. And it was during this time that the idea of using swordsmanship and wrestling was put into the school systems as an adjunct to help uh, focus on physical fitness and social conformity to help support the war machine. Uh, during a time when Japan no longer had the samurai warrior. And so uh, the island of Okinawa, uh, uh, depleted from its natural reservoirs, uh, treasuries uh, drained dry over the, the last century, uh, also felt the need to want to contribute 
uh, as you know, uh, the draft was invoked and in, uh, the medical examination started around 1879, 1880. And, 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 and our pioneers, Hanashiro, Chomo, Yabu, Kenso, people of that nature, were beginning recognized by medical examiners for something down here in Okinawa is making you guys really fit. What is it? Oh gosh, it's this practice. And it gave the Japanese military a, an opportunity to want to explore the possibility that that tradition might otherwise uh, be an important contribution to the war machine as well. And so that opened up the door for another person named Itosu Anko, uh, who is actually, just as a matter of historical, is my teacher's teacher's teacher. My teacher was Kinjo Hiroshi. His teachers were Hanashi Ochomo, Gusukumi Shimpan, and Tokura Amu, who learned directly from Itosu Anko. And so in that regard, Itosu Anko, with the support of uh, those local authorities, brought out from behind the closed doors of obscurity the old practices and modified them much in the same way that, say, Takano Sasaburo Nakayama Hakuto brought together schools of swordsmanship to create EI and, and Kendo and Judo with Kano Jigoro Sensei. And Itosu said, you know something, I can modify the practices as well. We can put kata into the school system. And by putting kata into the school system, we too will not only contribute, we then will also give the opportunity to bring uh, rise to the value of our cultural heritage at the same time. So, as karate began to become popular through the school system, which it did, it found its way to the mainland of Japan. And from the times of probably around 1916 till, till the Daina Pampa Tokukai ratified it as a new tradition in December of 1933, you have men like Mateoshi Shinko, Moldo Choki, Funukoshi Gichin, Gima Shinken, um, uh, Mabuni Kenwa, uh, Miyagi Chojin, Toyama Kanken, Chitoshi Tsuyoshi, uh, Uechi Kanbun, people like that coming up haphazardly introducing their practices, then falling victim to the deruku yoaltariru, which is this metaphoric phenomena of the protruding nail ultimately gets pounded down in this conformist based society. And therefore, the, the weight and the force of Japanese Buddha culture upon the foreign Chinese slash Southeast Asian based practices being brought up from, the, uh, from Okinawa were compelled then to conform into uh, becoming more like a Japanese Buddha. And in December of 1933, when it was ratified as Nippon Karate Do, a new Japanese uh, martial art, uh, one way with which to help better embrace it was to put it back into the school system where it exploded. But keep in mind, if we contrast it with the other popular martial arts of that era, say Kendo and Jiro, you know, in Kendo, you know, you learn uh, uh, the uh, Taisabaki, uh, you, you get the Yoro, you learn the Ski, the Man, uh, the Kote, and the Do, and then you uh, you can fight with each other. So there's Kihon Baza, the fundamental techniques, and then you really can have a great workout, okay? And uh, Judo is the same way. You learn Ukemi Waza, how to protect yourself from falling on the ground. You learn the Sabaki, uh, uh, you can do the Uchikomi uh, to learn the preparation for the throw. And once you get these dynamics, you can engage in what they call randori, like a sparring type of thing. But when karate was introduced, it was just kata, 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 solo representations back and forth all the time. No kihon waza, no breaking it down, building top. There wasn't that. That, that had not evolved yet. Kihon waza, as we know today, was developed in the 20s and 30s by Konishi Yasuhiro, Otsuka Hironori. And so what happened was the young thinkers of that era said, have to continue to evolve this much in the same light that Kendo and Judo happened. And therein lies the ability to then to test your skills. And one of the criteria set forth by the Daina Pampa Tokai, other than the belt and the gi and the changing of the label, was to find a platform, a competitive platform like Kendo and Judo, based upon the Ikken Hisatsu to kill with a single blow. And, the, and uh, so what they, they use is they use the Ippon Shiai Shobu. Uh, and they created that if he does this, you do that. But if I hit you with a blow, that would be an ippon. And if I kicked you, I don't know why the kicking only got a wazari, but nonetheless, I, ki I kicked you in the colonies, you got a wazari. But I punched you in the face, and I killed you. And therein, we see the birth of a sport. Now, come on. A sport, a competitive phenomenon put into the school system, man. That's what young people thrive upon. And the competitive nature of adversarial training, that's what really draws out the ability to continue to progress and progress in the tradition. That is the answer. Awesome. So finally, last question. 
What is your best advice for a modern karate practitioner who wants to perhaps give his karate some deeper meaning by exploring the, the roots and connecting with the history? How can we do that as modern karate practitioners? Study. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, critical thinking, the ability to think outside the box and not be intimidated by authority um, uh, allows us as in the West, particularly because individuality is much more the yardstick we use to measure ourselves as opposed to the conformance-based culture. Um, our best friends should be, they, the six should, the six best friends, they, their names should begin with the letter W and the seventh with the letter H. And the more questions we ask, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the critical thinking is the most acceptable mechanism in our culture to help uh, penetrate the ambiguity of this tradition and, and, and to reveal the inner essence of what is actually uh, not a difficult uh, 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 science and art to understand. And in doing so, by continuing to ask questions, we continue to deepen our understanding of the tradition that brings us together. And that would be what my advice would be. Love it. Thank you so much, Hanshi Patrick McCarthy, for this lovely interview. Thank you very much, everybody.